Good afternoon, everyone. I see everybody starting to join us. Uh, we've got a huge crowd coming, so we're just going to have a, a bit of a hello at the beginning, a little bit of a chat about what's going to be happening this afternoon. And uh, we might repeat ourselves a bit when more people join us. Uh, and then we'll get started. So my name's Sharon Walpole. I'm from CareerMap, a director at CareerMap. And I'm delighted to be joined by JTL's team this afternoon to talk about uh, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the building services and engineering sector. It's a CPD event for teachers and career leaders, so I hope we'll get a lot of really useful and interesting information to be able to help you do your job and to tick that CPD box. Just to let you know what to expect for today, we have, um, the JTL team have got a really interesting and informative uh, short video to show you. That will give you lots of facts and figures and some other materials that you can download and take home. You'll also notice next to your screen, we have a chat box that's live throughout. It's live now, in fact, so feel free to say hello and uh, pop in any messages that you like. We will be answering some questions throughout the uh, session, but we will definitely be having a Q&A at the end where we'll be able to speak to everyone and answer all your questions. So I'll be gathering those up and um, hosting that for you later. In the meantime, I'll just give you a little bit of housekeeping rules. Um, be, be nice or we will have to eject you, uh, but you can use the Q&A and um, say hello. Uh, it is being recorded and you will be able to find it if you have to leave early. We have the career map website is career map live and all of our videos from all of our webinars are hosted there. So you can watch back at a later date. It'll probably be early next week that it'll be on. And we will also be putting some uh, links in, but feel free to chat with each other as well. One thing that's really great with CPD is to meet other people and to share some information. Um, I'll let uh, my two guests that you see here from GTL introduce themselves. So Lindsay, if you'd like to start. Yep, hi everyone, good afternoon. My name's Lindsay Talks and I work um, on the, the plumbing side of, of JTL apprenticeships. And Nikki? Hi everyone, my name's Nikki um, and I do the same role as Lindsay, but I look after the electrical, fire and security and engineering side of things. Great. Well, I suppose we'll get ready to start. If you're ready, uh, Nikki, before we go, um, our team will be turning our cameras and microphones off, but we're here. Don't worry. Feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A, like I said. And as soon as this short uh, video is finished, we'll have a chat about so any of your questions about that or anything else that you might have, plus a nice little discussion between us. So I'll see you afterwards. Welcome to our presentation, An Essential Guide to JTL Apprenticeships in the Building Services Engineering Sector. We'd like to begin with a short film to introduce you to who we are and what we do. We are JTL. JTL is a not-for-profit charity and one of the largest work-based learning providers in the UK. We have been providing work-based learning for over 30 years. We specialise in apprenticeship training to the Building Services Engineering Sector. Our apprentices are trained to a professional standard, providing the skills they need to pursue lifelong careers. We have brought together thousands of businesses and learners who have all benefited from apprenticeship training. Our apprenticeship courses have opened up new careers for electricians, plumbers, heating engineers and many more skilled professionals. We also help professionals who already work in the industry by offering continued professional development. From our headquarters in Orpington and our national JTL training centres, we train thousands of apprentices each year. We have trained around 60,000 apprentices over our 30-year history. With more than 390 staff, including dedicated training officers, we work closely with our apprentices and over 3,500 employers across the country. JTL also works with around 100 partner colleges in England to deliver apprenticeship training. Since 1990, we have been driven by one vision, 
to be the training organization of choice for the building services engineering sector. Stay connected with us and keep up to date with our latest news and activities on social media. Visit our website for more information about JTL and our apprenticeships at www.jtltraining.com. So, now you know a bit about us, let's find out more about the apprenticeship programmes we offer. What is an apprenticeship? Apprenticeships are government funded programmes that include a paid job. They involve on and off the job training, incorporating both technical knowledge and practical performance. Apprenticeships are a nationally recognised qualification. Apprenticeships also contain transferable skills modules. Apprenticeships are available to anyone aged 16 and over. The benefits of an apprenticeship. Apprentices can earn while they learn. Starting salaries are in the region of £21,000 per year for electricians, but earnings up to £32,000 and beyond are achievable once fully qualified. There's no debt at the end of the apprenticeship. Apprentices will gain valuable work experience and learn firsthand from experienced tradespeople. They will also gain practical skills and theoretical knowledge as part of their studies. University is still an option after an apprenticeship, sometimes an employer will fund a university course. Entry requirements. JTL do expect individuals to meet certain criteria such as passing our online assessment tests and also possessing GCSEs in maths and English at grade C or grade four or higher. Individuals, however, can work towards achieving their level two qualifications in maths and English as part of their apprenticeship. These level two qualifications will need to be achieved before an endpoint assessment is taken, usually in year four of the apprenticeship. Individuals can apply for an apprenticeship while they are still in education, but they need to have left before they can start with us. As a rule of thumb, they must have left compulsory education after the last Friday in June of the academic year in which they are applying. Individuals will also need an employer before they can start an apprenticeship, although they can apply before they have arranged one. Here's a brief summary of the apprenticeship courses we offer. At JCL, we offer the following apprenticeships. Electrical engineering at level three, plumbing and domestic heating at level three, building services engineering at levels two and three, gas engineering operative at level three, fire emergency and security systems at level three, and property maintenance operative at level two. The electrical engineering level three advanced apprenticeship lasts four years and covers a wide range of units, including health and safety in the workplace, the installation and maintenance of electrical systems, and how to diagnose and correct faults. Qualified electricians will install, maintain and repair electrical systems and inspect and test electrical installations. An endpoint assessment and portfolio of evidence must be passed to achieve the apprenticeship. The qualification achieved on successful completion of this apprenticeship is a level three electrotechnical qualification in installation or in maintenance. The plumbing and domestic heating level three apprenticeship usually takes 48 months, which is four years to complete. This apprenticeship allows individuals to train for several career roles in plumbing at the same time, such as plumber, domestic heating installer or engineer, and plumbing and domestic heating installer or engineer. Plumbing and domestic heating technicians plan, select, install, service, commission, and maintain all aspects of plumbing and heating systems. The training is coupled with maths and English and includes end of year phase tests throughout the four year course. All learners must complete a standard endpoint assessment or EPA to achieve the level three apprenticeship. We offer three apprenticeship courses in building services engineering, a level two and level three. These are building services engineering, installer, level two, building services engineering, craftsperson, level three, building services engineering, service maintenance engineer, which has no mandatory qualification. Building services engineers work on large scale industrial and commercial systems, founding offices, 
factories, schools and hospitals, such as heating, chilled water, hot water and cold water systems. Building service engineering apprenticeships cover two distinct job roles, that of an installer and of a craftsperson. An installer installs components of these systems. They have a basic knowledge of these systems and how the components within them relate to each other. A craftsperson undertakes the installation, testing, pre-commissioning, commissioning and decommissioning of these systems. They have a detailed knowledge of how these systems operate. Service and maintenance engineers, on the other hand, play a key role in planning and completing a range of maintenance work on these systems. Gas engineering operative level three apprenticeship. Gas engineers install and maintain gas appliances in a domestic or non-domestic setting. Gas appliances can include central heating boilers, unvented hot water storage, ducted air heaters, cookers, and alternative fuel, for example. The course lasts for two to three years, depending on the levels of experience the learner already has. Once qualified as a gas engineer, learners will be registered on the gas safe register as competent to undertake work on at least four appliances. Fire Emergency and Security Systems Level 3 Apprenticeship This apprenticeship will provide apprentices with a clear pathway towards becoming a fully qualified technician, engineer or installer of alarm, fire, emergency and security systems. The typical completion time of this course is 36 months. Learners can choose a specific pathway in one of the four options to suit their individual careers. These are fire, security, fire and emergency lighting, and fire and security. By the end of the apprenticeship, the apprentice will have satisfied the requirements for EngTech registration by the Engineering Council. The course is currently delivered in two locations, in the Midlands and in Essex. The Property Maintenance Operative Level 2 Apprenticeship is designed for those wishing to gain the technical knowledge and practical skills required to work within the property maintenance industry in job roles like maintenance assistant, facilities assistant, maintenance technician, caretaker or janitor. Property maintenance operatives work in a wide variety of sectors, including housing, healthcare, social care, hospitality, education, leisure and retail. Their main role is to ensure the properties they maintain are in a good condition and that everything works properly and meets health and safety guidelines. The qualification is the City and Guilds Level 2 Diploma in Property Maintenance, which is professionally recognised by the British Institute of Facilities Management and provides associate membership for the apprentice while studying. The availability of this course is currently limited to specific areas of the country, so please contact us for details of course locations or to express your interest. Traineeships. Traineeships are a stepping stone onto an apprenticeship and are a great way for individuals to discover if they want to progress to an apprenticeship in a particular trade. They last for 10 weeks on average with around six weeks spent in the classroom where trainees will learn about good CV writing, interview skills, health and safety knowledge and knowledge of the relevant industries amongst other things. Trainees will then have around four weeks work experience with an employer where they will begin to learn some on the job practical knowledge. Traineeships are currently available through JTL in Birmingham, Nottingham and in Ashford and in Alpington in Kent. How we teach. JTL has its own training centres across the country and has partnerships with over 100 colleges across England and Wales. The main apprenticeship start dates are in September and in January to coincide with college intakes, but we recruit throughout the year. Teaching is delivered in either a block release or day release format. Each apprentice has an experienced training officer dedicated to supporting them through the apprenticeship. All apprentices will develop a portfolio of their work over the course of their apprenticeship. Let's find out what some of our apprentices think of their training. So far, I think my apprenticeship has been going really well and I've been really enjoying it. My apprenticeship so far has been really good. I've learned a lot of new things and I've really tested myself. I'm really enjoying my apprenticeship. It's given me a really good start in life at my young age. Being able to earn money and save money at 17 is such a massive thing. Made quite a, look, quite a few new friends. 
like have enough money to enjoy myself at the weekend. Guys at JTL have been really supportive and helpful. Um, my boss has been really good um, helping me learn as I go along. It's really good. Uh, the tutors are really helpful um, and, and very knowledgeable as well. I've realised it's a lot more difficult than I first imagined, but it's if you're willing to put in the learning and the effort, it is very rewarding, especially any of the money's, money's alright. It's been good. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning fast. And uh, hopefully one day I'll be as good as the people that are teaching me. How to apply. Interested individuals can apply online, but they will need to pass JTL's online test. Details of how to apply online can be found on the JTL website. The best option is for individuals looking to apply is to find an employer first. Tips on how to find an employer can also be found on the JTL website. To find out more about JTL, our apprenticeship programmes and how to apply, please visit our website. Please also like our Facebook and Twitter pages. Thank you for watching this presentation. Greetings everyone. Really uh, useful video and nicely done. Is that your beautiful voice on there, Nikki, or have you got someone else doing the... Uh... No, not my voice. I do think I know who it is though. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us and thank you everybody in the crowd. I hope you found that useful and, uh, and interesting. And one of the questions that came up a couple of times are people are asking about resources and that was resources um, for teachers to share but also some young people were wondering if they had some for students. If you do, maybe I know you had brought some things with you you might want to talk about um, and also where they could go to find them if you've got downloadable ones on your site. Okay, so yes we do is the answer um, and we have we have kind of different variations of how they're formatted as well so I think one of the easiest things we can do is direct you to our website um, but also our, our marketing team are also more than willing to help so we've got an admin center based in Wrexham which you can find the phone number from our, our website um, for and if you do need some stocks to send to the schools um, so you have got them for careers events and things you're having on site um, absolutely feel free they're also well we were also able to email them to you so if you want them so you can print them yourselves that's absolutely fine as well um, however it works easier for you um, you might find you like it that you are able to actually sort of forward those emails on as well so you can pass them to maybe parents and guardians who are um, inquiring as well as your pupils so I suppose it can be working both ways in that respect um, but yeah we have that for every product that we have um, so there's some of the questions that came up on things like entry requirements how long the course lasts those kinds of things are all detailed in each of those uh, flyers as well so absolutely more than happy to help if any uh, if any schools colleges anybody wants those details we're more than happy to share those with you um, great. I see Lindsay answered one of the questions. That was a bit of a theme that had come out, but maybe you could expand on this as well, that people were asking about um, helps with the help with the exam um, and then also following on with that about finding employers. Uh, and maybe it's a good thing, assuming teachers don't know and educators don't know how apprenticeships work in terms of that, perhaps you could kind of expand on that one. Absolutely. So um, um, considering what we've been through as a nation over the last 18 months, there's actually more employers than we could have ever possibly imagined who are currently looking to fill places on apprenticeships. So there's a couple of things you can do. On our website, uh, we do actually have a uh, page where we have some of the vacancies showing. Um, a lot of the employers will not actually advertise those, them themselves as well. Personal suggestions are go into things like good old-fashioned yellow pages, um, have a look if they're looking for say an electrical um, 
company or a plumbing company in their local region, go and have a look at who's out there, but actually to go for the trade associations as well. So there are organisations such as um, NEC, EIC, the ECA for electrical, you can go on and you can find that, say, think of it like you were a customer. So that's probably the best advice I could give. If you were a customer and you were looking for an electrician or a plumber, um, where would you find local people who are able to provide that service? That could then be your target list for sending your CVs um, or calling them um, and asking them if they Put, got the potential for having an apprenticeship. I would definitely say try some of your large companies as well. So we work with a lot of large national providers, a lot of large building companies, for example, um, and they have their you know, very, very structured uh, apprenticeship programs and will recruit every single year in fairly high volumes as well. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to just literally put your details out there. From a timing respect, I think that's really important as well. So, for example, this is quite late in the year for someone to be applying to start, say, this September, but it's not impossible. Um, some people might put somebody, I, I noticed the thing about um, work experience coming through. They may have done a trial with somebody and actually it didn't work out. So they may have thought they were going to have somebody that was going to be ready to start um, in their September group. They may have worked with us already and we know there's a college place waiting for that person. And actually, and this genuinely happens re fairly regularly, it's a different person who ends up going to college uh, because that it might the learner didn't like it. So for you, you know, for, for, for whoever is listening, be it that you're a careers advisor, a trainer, teacher, a, a learner, potentially, um, you know, sort of you might try that work experience out with them, which some do offer just to give you a trial before you start. You might find the role's not for you. you now, a lot of our tradesmen and females as well, very important, um, start quite early in the morning, for example. They might be getting picked up from home 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's not unrealistic if the jobs they've got to go to that day are further away. So you might find that that doesn't suit everybody um, and they decide this isn't the kind of roles they want or they want a different setup. So I think that's the thing people need to think about as well. What do you want? Do you want to be going to a different town every day in a different location all the time? So are you going to go for an employer that works in that way? Um, or do you want to be in one base? So we've got some um, some learners who are, say, doing maintenance work rather than installations, and they might be based in one building or a small group of buildings, and they're based in those all the time, every day. They know where they're going every single day. Uh, for others, that would be horrendous, uh, really monotonous, and they like the idea of going and meeting different people every, every single time they're going out. Or they're doing blocks of work on one site for a couple of months, then they're moving on, going to another one. So I think thinking about what you want from it and how how your lifestyle works around that as well is a really important thing to consider when you're applying to potential um, sort of employers that are out there. But don't be afraid to just approach them directly. They expect that in these industries. Um, it, it's, you know, it's it is almost a numbers game in some respects, but speak to people you know as well, family, friends, neighbours, you know, do you know someone that's done some work locally? Have have people done work in someone's home or in a local business? Do you see their van driving around? Just try them. We did get a couple of questions about where they're located. Um, I know you've got uh, your premises, if you want to remind everybody where they are, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not wider opportunities. Is that right? No. So um, we have, well, I'd say we have 10 centres, but 13 because we have some very close connections with other organisations. Um, P&R Hurt in the Oval is a good example. So it's not a JTL centre. But it's completely set up in a JTL way. We, we work entirely with them. But although we've got those 10, 12 centres, so they are like Orpington, um, Oxford, Birmingham, Nottingham, um, Carlisle, York, Tankersley, <laughs> Norwich, off the top of my head. Um, but on top of that, we work with almost 100 other colleges. So we don't work with every single college that, that's out there. And there could be a multiple of reasons for that. Sometimes it's because they want to work with the learners themselves they want to put their own learners through their own apprenticeships um, and they you know they don't want to, to engage with somebody who's doing it as an apprenticeship provider um, sometimes it's um, it's going to sound really bad but it's quality um, sometimes it's about pr the quality of the provision and us getting what we need from them so it might be that that's the reason we don't work with them that sounds very brutal but that is the reality as well um, but you know we do work with over a well, very nearly 100, I would actually say it is at right this second. Um, and they all provide different things for us. So not every product is available in every single location. It's just worth asking the question. The other thing that comes with that as well is um, 
I know it mentioned it in the, the, the little film and the slides that came with it. There is that difference between doing block and day release as well. So again, sometimes it might be an employer chooses to go with a particular college that might not be the most local college, but it's because they offer it delivered in a different way. So for example, if they do lots of local work, they might be quite happy that someone goes um, into a college and does day release and that suits them. That might be the business owners. Do you think we've got from a single owner employer worker you're know, just working with uh, I hate the phrase a one man band but it explains it fairly well you've got a single person working with you who owns the business up to b b big national international companies so some some will say well actually that's my admin day I don't know for argument's sake on a Wednesday that's the day you're going to college um, and that works beautifully well for them. For others, if they're going to different towns and locations all the time, especially if they have a young person with them who's 16, 17, not driving, actually it might be very complicated for them to get that person back to do day release and it's much easier for them to plan their work and where they're going and who they've got to support that task, that job that they're working on, uh, to yeah, not have you there for the whole week and plan jobs that didn't include the person, uh, their, their, their apprentice. So it can vary completely and it might be sometimes not just based on the location and the ease of access, sometimes it's based on whether it's block or day release that's being offered by some colleges, some both. So we work with colleges that we've got lots of learners with, um, whole classes of learners, so JTL learners with them um, and some are doing block release, some are doing day release because there are so many we've got enough to fill all of those places if that makes sense but I think it's it's one of those just ask is the honest answer um, because again as you get later in the year the earlier people apply the earlier we know they want to come to us the advantage is we're much more likely to secure um, a college place exactly where it is they're looking to go there might need to be more flexibility if they're play, like sort of I, and we do literally get people applying September even into October um, who've just found an employer who have just worked through their uh, again work placement kind of side of things or the work trial I think is a better word than a work placement um, and uh, yeah they're just coming to us then looking for a college place um, it might be the employers just picked up a very large contract and gone you know what time's right to take on an apprentice so again it comes really late again in those circumstances it might not be the first choice that you want to get to but just ask the question it changes constantly is the honest answer um, so it's just worth trying uh, but it, it literally is from Realistically, down from Plymouth, um, literally all the way up to the, you know, sort of north into Kent, e e into Wales as well. For any, if in case there are any Welsh um, sort of participants as well. Um, so you know, literally across mainly England, but there is a little bit of Wales as well. Um, and yeah, the length and breadth of the country, basically. Uh, we had a couple of questions that had come through about um, COVID, both on mm -hmm. the impact of training um, and one yeah. even had a scenario that if there was another lockdown, what happens then? And perhaps you could talk in general just about the changes that have happened during, but with the long term kind of learnings Absolutely. you might have from that. And then also I would suggest we could follow that on with the career opportunities, again, in mind with the COVID and lockdown. OK, so absolutely. Of course, it had a huge impact. And I think for us, like any any course that has a huge practical element, you think a lot of the work we do, uh, the easiest way of describing how it works in college for a lot of our learners and almost every whether it's plumbing whether it's electrical is there's almost a 50 50 split so 50 percent of their time in college is spent in the classroom and roughly 50 percent is spent in a workshop doing the practical side of things so what covid meant we needed to do was we needed to flip ourselves to a blended learning approach we needed to do the classroom based things we we're able to obviously deliver online we use google classrooms on the whole um Again, it might vary if they're at the different college, they might have a different format for doing that. But we had access to almost converting our lessons onto Google Classrooms um, and being able to deliver that knowledge part, what it held up and what it will hold up. And there's no working around that almost. Um, if there's a complete lockdown like there was initially, was that practical element, um, obviously to keep our learners safe, to keep our employers and our employees safe as well. Um, what we've got now is we've got almost the um, sort of one plus version. So we're trying to make sure people are keeping to the same tools. Um, people are still at this point wearing uh, face masks in the classrooms and in public spaces. Um, but wherever we can, we're, we're making sure that that learning goes ahead. So it can definitely go ahead on the classroom learning 
uh, from from uh, an online version of doing the classrooms. And that is directed. That's not just shoving worksheets at them, if that makes sense. That's guided lessons with their tutor, face to face delivery still like we're almost doing now. I know it's not quite the same as being in a classroom, but I'm sure you're all very aware of how things have had to move around in the last sort of 15, 16 months. So we have tried to maintain as much as we can normal delivery and normal time scales because that's the important part is how much does that hold that learner up at the end of their program? And what we ended up doing is bringing some of our learners back in early from um, from the summer break. We brought them in on almost like block uh, classroom sessions, well, workshop sessions, so we could catch up with that workshop delivery that they'd missed out on by just having the classroom based things when we were kind of flipping into the lockdowns when, um, when classes were closed. There's the other reality of this. So I said we have basically 13 centres, three at the moment have a situation where they've had somebody who's tested positive. We are ready to flip that instantly. So if we have classes who need to go and isolate, so long as they're well, there's no reason they can't still attend their classes. Obviously, if they're unwell, that's a whole different issue. Um, but yeah, there's no reason we can't just flip those instantly now. So. I have to say, like everyone, it was a huge challenge when we first did that. But um, yeah, it, it's perfectly, perfectly possible for learning to continue. There's no reason it can't. It is that workshop based that gets held up, if I'm honest. Well, um, I guess one of the other questions here, we had a couple asking about uh, where are these jobs located and relocation and young people getting from A to Z, which of course is, is impacted by COVID as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally, um, I guess, whatever normal times will be, <laughs> um, how is this dealt with? I mean, do, t do people tend to go college locally, work locally, or do you find people going all over Ab the place? Absolute variation. Um, so again, some employers have changed the way they work. They've changed the kinds of uh, jobs that they're taking on. Um, it, and it really does depend on the employer as well. So, for example, some of our employers do pickups. They might ask a learner to go to, I don't know, um, a sort of a, a main junction or a main bus stop and they will collect them from there. They will pick them up and then take them to the job. Um, it might be they've got a supervisor they work with that might live locally. It actually, when you think about it, is almost fascinating how it just works itself out. I would say, though, realistically, that this is, you know, we're, we're looking at trades where, it is exceptionally likely that in the longer term, um, learners need to consider learning how to drive because that makes an absolute world of difference. And in the long term, if they're not based on one site, it is likely uh, in their career that they're going to need to be learning to drive as well. Some employers, um, you know, a lot of our programs are four years long, will stipulate that that should be a goal for the learner by the time they complete as well. Uh, because obviously it has an impact on the other their, their work colleagues if they're having to go out of their way to collect somebody. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's 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 there are the issues over when the transport was reduced, um, but somehow it just seems to have worked itself out. I don't I don't know. I think you know at, at the end of the day, if the employer wants that member of staff to make it to work, they've made it happen. However, they've made it happen. Sometimes parents have pitched in. Um, so sometimes they've helped out. They may have been on furlough and have supported, but that's not something you can rely on as well. Um, and I think, you know, sort of, again, looking at where that college is and where the work is, they're almost two very separate things as well. Um, so accessibility is definitely something that needs to be considered. Uh, um, you don't want to make your life difficult uh, wherever possible, uh, but it does depend on where you live. And uh, yeah, how how close you are to learning how to drive if you're not already um, and then what your public transport access is um, or again how your whole household setup is. I mean it might be sometimes you'll have situations where learners live close by. You can't ever guarantee this though so there's you know huge issues with this but they'll often work it out between their, their counterparts at college. They'll realise someone lives in the village they drive through on their way to college so they will just decide to pick them up and the other one will chip them a little bit of money to help them get to college a bit easier than going on public transport. Again, always fascinates me. But you've then got the issue, what if they were off sick? What if they left the programme? Where would that leave you? So you've got to be realistic about arrangements like that as well. Well, it does. Uh, one of the things that I do love about apprenticeships, and I think for the educators who might be listening in at the moment, is I think it's probably worth talking about the support um, that is offered in that environment uh, that could be different than, say, going to university where they're just kind of sent mm -hmm. off 
into the world. Um, and uh, it is one of the things that um, I've been involved in the apprenticeship sector for a long time. And there's a lot of love there and a lot of yeah. encouragement and support. Um, definitely. I mean, we try to do what we can to support our employees. There's things we do as well that say, for example, a local college wouldn't. So it might be they're getting the advantage of of, I don't know, getting the student union card and going to the local college and going to the college where all their friends from school um, are going. Uh, but actually, they're still an employee, so they're already earning what they're learning. The, obviously, the main advantage a lot of people see uh, of going into apprenticeship. I think when you're working with the trades, though, it's the most accepted route as well, um, is that, you know, you need that on the job training and nothing, no other pathway beats that. Don't get me wrong. There are other routes. Of course, there are. But it doesn't mean and I, and I think it's an important part as well, you know, that these learners can go on and go on and do, do degree apprenticeships. You know, some of our employers are are funding their learners because they're so impressed with how they've worked with them. They are uh, sort of working with them to, to improve their skills and look at where that business and succession planning goes with some of our larger companies as well. You know, we've got a lot of industries, a lot of industry employees who are getting older. Um, who are looking to retire. We've got, without mentioning names, we've got one very big company I can think of that's national that's looking at their succession planning, looking at the fact that most of the directors are close to retirement and several of our apprentices have been chosen to be on their management program because they're planning that they're the directors of the future. You know, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, looking at those further pathways for for the building services engineering sector is really important as well because it might be learners want to go on they want to do a degree they want to they want to succeed they want to earn well um, and actually I don't think you can go far wrong with this sector I really really don't I think some of the salaries you can end up going into I was gonna ask are that next fantastic were, if you could talk about that because there was mm. a couple of people who had asked a question about the salaries and the kind of earnings uh, you know the immediate and longer term yeah so um, okay this is it's a slightly more complicated one, um, but so obviously they need to pay, be paid at least national minimum wage for apprenticeship rate. There is a but there. We actually don't recommend that to employers. Um, we recommend that um, they pay what are the JIB rates. So the, the union that support a lot of this sector um, have a whole different pay scale that they recommend. Uh, and in each year of the apprenticeship, that goes up accordingly. Don't quote me. I think it's £5.24. It starts on now, um, which for a 16 year old is better than they would be getting into a sort of smaller part time job. But a lot of employers choose to pay more. Um, and I think there's logic in the fact that the further into their program, the learner is, the more value they add to the business, the more work they're able to do independently, then the more they're getting paid. And that is absolutely and actively encouraged. Again, I won't mention company names, but I have employers who by the time the learners finish with us are already on £40,000 a year. My um, and that's not an exaggeration. They are because they're working hard. They're being paid for their travel time. They're being paid for everything they're doing within that workplace. And, you know, you think they could be 20 years old at that point and on £40,000. That's really So it amazing. is perfectly possible. And that's not inside London rates either. So London rates are, and, and again, the way the unions work with supporting the sector is they do actually have a very clear structure on inner London and sort of outside of London um, rates too. But the JIB pay rates, and I don't know if one of my colleagues can drop that in because I'm sure we all have access to that. Um, but if not, I can try and find it and drop it in myself. Um, that's open access information. Anyone can kind of download that, get hold of it. Um, but yeah, we, we do encourage our employers to pay more than minimum wage as well. You know, these are high paying sectors. Um, I'd say that we don't do the engineering so much. In, and I did notice the engineering sort of bit on there. We don't offer engineering so much, but, you know, we work in um, in a couple of science parks. So I want our Oxford sites actually in uh, Cullum, which is a science park. Um, we work, we have Harlow really nearby and we have a lot of apprentices who are in there. They started on 15,000 as their first year apprenticeship rate with a guarantee of 50,000 when they complete. But they're working in satellite industries. Uh, you know, they're, they're working with some, again, really high end employers um, that are training them to be a real part of their future. And they're paying them well enough that they don't want them to go once they've trained them. They want to Obviously, keep them yeah. and nourish and nurture that talent so they can become part of the future of that business. Um, so. 
yeah, you know, that's not, not what you'll always get. You'll also get your 15, 20 thousands as the, you know, sort of like just about sort of end rate. Um, but it's that it's getting their endpoint assessment through. So now we're into all new starts being standards. Uh, it's getting that endpoint assessment through. And that is what will change their salaries, basically. As soon as that endpoint assessment is completed and they've done that final uh, exam, that's when they're going to notice the real significant change on the salary side. Um, but yeah, there is a future and there are good salaries. And um, one of the subjects that came up as well, and I'm actually very curious about, is women in the sector. So, Do you know what? Um, I was waiting for that. <laughs> yeah. And then it's not, and, I, and I'd really like to explore this a little bit because we all say, particularly in these traditionally mm -hmm. male dominated sectors, they all want women. They're all begging for women to come. Definitely. I'd like to turn it around a little bit and, and talk to young women or um, educators here who've got young women and, and, and what's in it for them? You know, I mean, we know why employers want to diversify. We know that they want to, you know, get all this bit, you know, but it could be quite scary. A young girl going into a sector of plumbers, you know. I, I do think there needs, to, I, I do think there's a certain character trait uh, because, it, it, you know, not everyone could deal with the fact they're in a very, very male orientated environment. Um, we have females on every program. The, the, the numbers are very low. They're sort of two to four percent on average. Um, but... I tend to find they do better than their male counterparts. That's going to sound really controversial, um, but because they work really hard and they almost feel they've got to prove themselves. Um, so I don't know. I, I think, you know, it's something we're always actively looking to, to increase is the female participation without question, just as we are, uh, you know, uh, any other targeted group that is not represented well enough within the industry as well. Um, you know, we have a deaf learner, for example, you know, it, it, if it's not unsafe and there are ways you can work around things, these opportunities should be open for absolutely anyone. For me, on that sort of female side of working within the sector, I, d I just think if, if it's something you're going to enjoy, and, and I think sometimes we miss out on a lot of, um, a lot of learners are almost pushed towards university where they're, because they're good with maths, they're good with science. And actually some of the trades we're looking at also have very high elements of that within them as well. And they're really, really important parts of it. But the earning potential, um, if that's what somebody is interested in, can be better than if they went to, to go and do a degree and then they need to pay back all their tuition fees and things afterwards. But also they've got that head start of four years within the industry and four years of experience that they won't have gained by going into uni as well. Um, so, you know, they've already started on their career path. They're already known to those organisations. They, you know, might, I think because, you know, we're, you're working with trades that often have subcontractors, they're working with other partners, that they get known by lots of other organizations within their area as well um, so they're getting their name out there before other people are even stepping out of university um, so again you know I can think where we were talking about the uh, director pathway for some of our learners two of those are females in 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 that group of five um, exactly. and it's not just because they were female it's because they were very good at their job um, and, right. you know, really, really worked very hard and proved themselves. Um, and it was a fantastic conversation with the director when he was explaining to me why they were being chosen to go through that pathway. Um, and, you know, that there, are, I think for a lot of the females who are in the sector, they actively want to shout out about it as well, because they're almost frustrated themselves that there aren't more females within the sector. Um, but yeah, don't, don't disregard it. You know, if somebody's looking at in maybe engineering or, you know, and, and you know, they're not quite sure which pathway they want to go down. I don't think it's bad for them to consider looking into this as a sector as well, not just from the engineering side, but actually from the electrical side. Um, the plumbing has got an awful lot more in it as well. You know, now that's a four year program, got the level three integrated into it as well. You know, there are still elements of electrical and things involved in there too. Uh, again, they can specialise. You know, you think there are sectors we're looking at here where we're looking at environmental, solar. There's a lot of new technology that's coming through that, again, they could, a, a, lot, a lot of the employers who are out there have been doing, we'll say the gas side, where they've been doing um, all the old gas boilers, that kind of thing. And again, that new talent needs to be brought through to look at those new technologies as well. And I think it's going to be a really interesting time for the sector. And the fact that they can get trained straight away to specialise in some of those new technologies. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Male or female? 
Brilliant. Well, I would like to say that um, for everybody who's watching this now or people who are watching this um, in the future, uh, that um, we've had quite a lot of activity going on in the chat and the team have been helping, but I've been trying to replicate those questions for this recording. Um, I just want to ask before we wrap up though, is there anything Nikki that you felt wasn't brought up or you'd like to um, talk about before we uh, start wrapping up for the, for the day? Um, no, I can see the bit from David W saying, um, how have students found the blended learning approach? Um, I would say, you know what, the reality is, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, everyone gets on differently with this. For some, we absolutely appreciate that it doesn't work so well. And where we've needed to, if we've needed to bring very small groups of learners in to, again, keep everybody safe, but we've realised that uh, the online approach really is not working for them, then if we need to find alternative models that work for them, but again, keep everyone safe so be it um, we are constantly surveying our learners constantly reaching out to them to get their feedback um, but it is a really important point um, that again we all learn differently and it doesn't work for everybody um, we have to do the best we can as I'm sure all of us are aware um, but it is about trying to be flexible with that model so it works to the best advantage of those learners uh, wherever we possibly can uh, but it is a really good point um, I don't know if there's anything else we haven't tackled that, at all. Sorry. Do you think that the blended learning and online will continue uh, for much longer or are you going to be trying to get back to face to face as soon as possible? Both. Um, I think there will be an element of blended and I think there's a place for it. But actually, we're looking at doing that in addition to a lot of things. So we're now looking at. Um, you know, videos that we can use. We've literally been doing some recordings this week, for example, in one of our centres um, for, for sort of support materials and things that we can provide for learners that will be accessible throughout their programmes. But I don't think it does any harm. We have no, no idea how long this is going to go on for, no idea how variants are going to have an impact on us in the long term. Um, I think we have to be ready that we can turn our model to whatever we need to do, whenever we need to do it, and as quickly as possible. So it has the least impact on learners and employers um, alike, because it's very important for both of them. Well, I think it's great that, um, and like I said, I've always felt that the um, apprenticeship sector have been very supportive and responsive. And, you know, we all care and want to get the best, uh, you know, for all the learners. So that's really brilliant to hear. Uh, what about you, Lindsay? You've been busy tapping away in the background and, and listening to the uh, online chat. For those people uh, and themes and things that you've call, uh, seen through that maybe we haven't touched on or you'd like to emphasize uh, on the video, do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I don't think so. I've tried to respond individually to everyone who's asked a question in the chat. There's lots of links in there, I would say. So, um, you know, click on some of those links. People are asking about tips for preparing learners for the maths and English tests that they do as part of the application. So I'll put in some links to useful sites there, things like that. And for our listeners out there, if you were unable, because you're not here live, to get those links, uh, where can they go? Uh, do you want to tell them where on the site at JTL they can go to or how they can get in touch with you to get further information? Uh, yes, if they just go to our website, which is www.jtltraining.com, uh, they'll be able to navigate from, from there. It's, it's nice and clear. It's recently updated, so they should be able to find everything they need. Great. There is a free phone number on there as well, and also kind of a main um, support email address as well that will go to our admin centre. So even if you can't find what you need, just ask someone will be there to respond for you. Great. And if you anybody out there who's watched this today wants to watch again or you want to share it, this video session, uh, this CPD session, I should say, is being recorded and will be a video uh, that will be available on careermap.co.uk forward slash career map live. Like I said, once we get it tarted up a bit, it will be up there uh, sometime early next week. I'd like to thank you to say thank you to everyone who's joined us today on this, well, not so sunny Sunday afternoon. It's not to, to Thursday afternoon. It's not too bad. I hope it's all right where you are. So uh, I'll allow my guests to say their farewells. Farewell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for listening. And goodbye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Take care of yourself and we'll speak to you. I uh, hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you. Goodbye.